Uncover the shocking truth about conventional financial planning as John Ensley takes you on a journey to dismantle the chaos and corruption of the system, revealing safe and predictable strategies to create wealth and protect your financial future. Welcome to Biz Help For You with host Candy Messer. Entrepreneurs like to focus on the big picture, like profitability, success, and a smooth running organization. But there always seems to be those little things like taxes, employee compensation, laws, regulations, and more. Now you can get the answers you need in one place. Join us today as we break it all down for you. Now, here's your host, Candy Messer. Hello and welcome to Biz Help For You with Candy Messer. Thank you for joining me today. If you missed my last episode and would like to listen to the show, links can be found on my social media pages as well as multiple favorite podcast platforms. And if you'd like to receive notifications on when my podcasts have been uploaded, please like and subscribe. Now, let me tell you a little bit about my guest today. John Ensley is leading a financial planning revolution to help you take back control of your money, your lifestyle, and your retirement plan. John believes ordinary financial planning is failing too many Americans. After losing almost everything during the Great Recession, John became obsessed with finding safe, predictable ways to save and create wealth protected from the chaos and corruption of the conventional financial system. Founded in 2012, John is president of J. Ensley Financial, a fiduciary and financial planning company. John holds a chartered financial consultant designation from the American College of Financial Services, passed the rigorous Series 65 Investment Advisors Law Exam, and is part of an elite group of highly trained bank-on-yourself professionals. So, John, welcome to the show. Thanks so much for having me, Candy. Another great topic that we're going to be discussing today on finance and the importance of, you know, even planning for your future, but maybe some of the downfalls that we don't realize that we're in. But before I get into any questions I have for you on the topic, I'd love for you to tell me just a little bit more about yourself and how you began educating others on finance. Absolutely. I'd love to share a little of my story. So my story really goes back to the late 90s. I got out of the military and went to work for a company and happened to be in the right place at the right time. And uh, if everyone out there remembers the late 90s, it was the buildup to the tech bubble. And so the company I was with was going to do an IPO and we had stock options and it was, you know, it was all going to be amazing. And it was a great company. I had great experience there. But of course, when the bubble burst, the IPO never happened and, and it just didn't turn out to be the way we thought it was going to. So that started the wheels turning a little bit, but I left that company with some money in an employee stock ownership plan, which is kind of like a 401k and did some calculations and realized that I wasn't real happy with the outlook on, on taxes later on. So I decided to do something different and went into a real estate investment. And of course, now we're building up to the mid 2000s and mm -hmm. uh, I had some some property in Washington. I subdivided, I was building spec homes. And again, if you remember the, the mid 2000s, the buildup and the appraisals were amazing and it was all gonna be amazing. And uh, I was about halfway through building that first spec home in 2008 mm -hmm. and when everything just, just crashed. And you know, I always throw in too that I made some big mistakes. I had no idea what I was doing. But the economic conditions, you know, it ultimately caused that project to to implode. So that was a real wake up call for me. I'm thankful for that experience because it was a wake up call. And so I started studying and reading just hundreds of books, blogs, anything I could get my hands on, mostly finance related, but also about life and business and, and so forth. I always had an itch to be an entrepreneur. I was working for a company again at that time, and then had this investment project on the side. And so during all of this research, I was on a webinar one night and uh, there was an advisor who was talking to about, about a couple and kind of mapping out a 30 year plan and retirement and so forth. And it had their home equity in there. And, and he, then he started talking about a cash value life insurance policy. 
And it was my first exposure to the idea that life insurance could be something other than a death benefit, that there might be some other <laughs> purpose. And so it got my attention and I started studying and reading more and finding more information about that topic and that concept and ran across a book called Becoming Your Own Banker by R. Nelson Nash, and then another one called Bank on Yourself. And these are just brand names that, that describe something that's been around a long time in a unique way to use cash value life insurance. So. I set up my own policies and started using them. And I, I got very excited about this idea. And the, the real turning point was when I realized that had someone shared this concept with me before the real estate project, it could have really turned the outcome of that project. And, and if nothing else, even if the whole thing failed like it did, I would have been able to bail myself out using this technique. And I'd been to many financial advisors. Nobody had ever mentioned this to me before. And so I decided, well, you know, I, I'm ready for a career change. I'm ready to, to kind of be my own business. And so I launched my practice in 2012, specifically to help people, entrepreneurs, et cetera, learn about this concept and, and implement if it's the right fit for them. Mm -hmm. And I know that from your interpretation, you know, the financial system just isn't working and it's chaotic and corrupt. So can you touch on that topic a little bit and explain to the listeners why you feel that's the case? Absolutely. And that's another reason that 2008 period was kind of that wake up call for me is, I, you know, I'm, I'm looking around while from the, the smoke and ash that I find all around myself, you know, I see bailouts going to big banks. I see mm -hmm. all these things going on around me. And yet, you know, everyone I know is, has lost huge values in their retirement plans. They're underwater on their, their homes. They're right. All these things were going on, but yet I know what, what, what jumped out at me is sort of the orchestrators of that crisis all got bailed out basically. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the rest of us had to figure it out, which of course we, we did. Cause that's, that's just how most people are. They figure it out. So that didn't seem unfair to me. And then as I went, kind of went down that path, I started learning about, you know, how our money comes into being a uh, fractional reserve banking system and the federal reserve and where that all came from. I don't want to go over the line into conspiracy theories, but there, there's a, a lot of very unsavory characters doing unsavory things that, that exist to this day. And that just kind of led me to the, and what, what I was looking, the question ultimately that I was looking to answer when I ran across the information that, that I did as far as the, this life insurance concept was how can I protect myself from it next time? Mm -hmm. How can I kind of build a wall or insulate myself from the most unsavory parts of the financial system in the future? And when I, when I ran across this information, it was the perfect fit. And so that, you know, that's what took me there. Mm -hmm. Well, even this year, there were some banks that had some issues, right? And there were some other banks coming in to buy, or, you know, the government was saying, we're going to help, you know, there's a lot of that that just occurred again, too, not on the same scope as what happened in the past. But I know some people are afraid, well, if the government doesn't come in, or if another bank doesn't come in and, you know, kind of protect the assets, we're going to lose out as consumers, right? So what would you say to someone who is like concerned that there are these bailouts, but at the same time, if we don't, like our financial situation is going to collapse? Right. It's a difficult situation. And, and I think if you look historically, a lot of people don't think understand the difference between a life insurance institution and a banking institution. Banks are in the business of taking risk, right? A bank takes in a dollar of deposits and they use that dollar to leverage $10 in loans to people doing whatever, and they can pretty much loan on anything they choose to. Mm -hmm. And insurance companies is, is almost opposite of that. They're in the business of mitigating risk. And so they take in a dollar of premium and that dollar of premium is just a dollar of premium. They can't leverage it 10 times. In other words, they can't inflate mm -hmm. the currency with that dollar. And they're also highly regulated in what they can do with their money. So an insurance company, the regulators make sure that they're putting their money in safe places that will allow them to meet their obligations. Whereas on the banking side, yes, they're regulated, but they can essentially invest in anything they want to with those inflated or leveraged dollars. So it's two totally right. different business models. And so I try to talk with, with folks about that with clients in understanding that Nothing is 100% safe. There's there's no such thing as 100% secure. We have to understand that first of all. But the the right types of insurance companies that have been around a long, long time, well over 100 years for many of them, are probably about the safest place that mm -hmm. that we can store cash. And that's really what this is about. Where where can we store 
money? Where can we store cash that we can use in excess and so forth? And there's different places where it can live. Well, and I was thinking while you were talking as well that I know I've heard that some of these companies are like mutual companies or they're owned by, you know, a lot of different people versus like a corporate type life insurance company. Like, how do you feel about the different types? Do you recommend one over another? You know, should we be concerned if one of them isn't like a mutual? I mean, I'd love your take on that as well. Absolutely. So I work only with mutual companies. And the, the reason being is, is without getting lost in the weeds of policy design technicalities, the way we design these policies, there is uh, with a mutual company, when they perform better than expected, they pay a dividend back out to the policy owners every year. And so that's, a, that's an important component of that cash value accumulation we're looking for in these policies. A shareholder company, when they perform better than expected, they pay the dividend out to their shareholders, not their mm. policy owners, right? So we want to be the policy owner in a mutual company and share in the benefits of, of the success of that company. And to put that in perspective, many of these companies have paid those dividends out to their policy owners every single year for over 100 years. So. Mm. Yes. Again, going back to the stability of an of an industry, you know, if you're you're a company, World War One, World War Two, the Great Depression, every crisis, recession, they didn't just survive; they performed better than expected and paid dividends to their policy owners. Those are just phenomenally stable companies. If you mm -hmm. pick the right ones, perfect for explaining that too, because sometimes it could be a little bit confusing. So I wanted to make sure we understood what that was too. I do know too that you also say conventional financial planning is like a casino. What do you mean by that? Well, isn't it interesting that most of the financial planning software out there today is based on a system called a Monte Carlo, mm. <laughs> right? And the, so a Monte Carlo system runs scenarios, hypothetical scenarios, computerized in multiple different ways. And that's where if, you, if you've ever gotten a financial plan from a typical financial planning company, it usually comes back and tells you you have a percent of success. Hmm. So it basically, you know, you're the way the plan, the way it's designed, you have an 80 percent or a 90 percent or a 92 percent chance, basically, that you won't run out of money before before you die. And I think it's important to remember that it's purely hypothetical and it's a system called Monte Carlo that's producing these percentages. So isn't that very much like playing the odds at at any kind of a, a table, if hmm. you were to go to a casino, right? And people that are into those kind of things, they know that blackjack maybe has better odds of, of coming out ahead than the craps tables or whatever the case may be. So I think there's a lot of parallels. The other thing that I think that happens is kind of conventional wisdom or conventional education says, put your money into a 401k and IRA, these pre-tax retirement plans. And then we just kind of cross our fingers and hope that 30 years down the road, it's it's going to do what it's supposed to do. And most people can't tell you what it's supposed to do. <laughs> it's hmm. it's uh, this, you know, it's going to accumulate. That's about as much as as we know. And so it's it's very much based on luck. If you don't control some factors, factors I refer to as money monsters. If we don't control the money monsters, then really it just comes down to luck. Mm -hmm. Well, and we are taught you should have a financial plan, right? And not just, mm -hmm. you know, put off until later. And there's, you know, compound interest and it's important to get into the market or have, you know, like if your employer matches a donation, you should participate in 401k. There's all these things that we hear and we think mm -hmm. we're doing the right things, right? But maybe we aren't meeting the goals that we have for ourselves. So like, what would you say about those types of things as well? Like, should we still be putting money in through our employers through a 401k for getting a match, but maybe only up to the match? Like, I'd love to have your feedback on kind of all of those types of things as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a lot of information we get in the financial services world that may or may not actually be true in the real world. So yes, we should have a plan for sure should have a plan. I'm not against planning, you know, or planning the wrong way, I guess I'll say. And we should all have savings. I think that's one of the things we miss in financial planning is a financial planning for most people means locking their money away somewhere where right. they can't get to it. And now we have statistics that say something like 40% of the American families uh, can't afford a $400 bill without borrowing money to cover it, right? We no longer have savings. We no longer have cash on hand to deal with 
the things that happen in life, you know, the, the transmission goes out on the car, or the mm-hmm. heater, you know, the furnace dies, whatever. And a lot of families no longer have the cash resources to deal with those emergencies because of, you know, they, they might have 50 or 100 or 200,000 in their 401k, but they can't pay for the transmission. Mm-hmm. And I think there's a real mismatch there in terms of having emergency funds and having access to cash. It's, it's super important. So the, the question of whether to contribute or how much to contribute is so individual. Every mm-hmm. single individual, that would be a, a, a analysis of all their circumstances to answer that question. I think in many cases, it does make sense to take advantage of a match if there's one available, but only up to the match mm-hmm. would be usually. And again, it's so circumstantial that, that I, I mean, I'm, not, I'm generalizing right now. So it, we, we should take advantage of some of those types of things in many cases, but we also have to remember, I said I did some calculation and I wasn't too happy with my tax outlook. And so I did something different. And, mm-hmm. and I think there's a lot of people in that situation as well, particularly entrepreneurs and small business owners where they're going to have a higher income while they're operating their business, but what's that exit plan down the road? You know, what position are you gonna be in at that point? And so all those factors have to come into play And, you know, the biggest thing is sit down with someone that can help you do the analysis, Mm -hmm. not someone who's just going to sell you. (laughs) Yes. Not someone who's just going to sell you stuff, by the way. Mm -hmm. And that's something we have to watch out for in the financial services world is, is there's a very, it's kind of a high pressure sales environment. And, and what we really need is to, to have a level headed analysis and, and make decisions. So the approach I take focuses on safety, keeping you in control and creating passive income streams. Those are the three Mm -hmm. key elements that that I focus on. Uh, Well, that's so important. And even while you were talking and referring to the lack of savings, I was thinking of that too, because I do try to encourage my clients to not only put money away personally, right, for a rainy day fund, but also for your business too. And we all know, Mm -hmm. right, what happened in 2020 too, a lot of people were really struggling because they didn't have access to the cash they needed. They were trying to keep employees on payroll if possible, but, you know, trying to meet payroll was difficult or paying for Mm -hmm. some of the things that they'd committed to, you know, for some of their supplies, it just became really difficult. And so it is important to have that cash available when an emergency arises or personally, like I said, if something breaks down or even in business, maybe an opportunity arises, but you still mm-hmm. need to have capital available. Maybe you need to buy a new piece of equipment that's going to help you expand your business. So I love that you touched on that, too, because a lot of people don't think about having that easily accessible cash. They're thinking, you know, building for the future and having that number, you know, so when I retire, right, I could pay for things, but we need to think about things now as well. Yes. And in particular for for the entrepreneur and the small business owner, I think it's it's super important. And that's one of the things that got my attention with this concept, whether you call it infinite banking or bank on yourself, there's been a lot of names applied to it, but it's using cash value life insurance as a platform. One of the mistakes I think people make is they compare a cash value life insurance policy to some other investment, to their 401k, to an IRA, to a real estate investing, whatever it is. But it, it's actually, it's a vessel, it's a place to hold mm-hmm. cash that has some unique features to it that then allows us to use that cash to go make those other investments. Mm -hmm. So it's not something we really compare. It's something we use to do the other. They go hand in hand. And so one of the things that really caught my attention early on was the ability to accumulate cash in a cash value policy and all the benefits and the death benefit and all of that that comes along with it is is all part of the scenario. But with, with policy loans, I have the ability to access that cash today to... Mm -hmm make purchase that equipment or whatever the case may be and essentially finance that myself using the cash values in the policy and then repaying my business re- can repay that that loan but the unique thing is while i'm doing that in the short term the policy continues to grow in the background as if i never borrowed the money from it so i'm protecting that long term compounding towards retirement while i'm using the money today to meet the needs or meet my cash flow needs or you know whatever that short term financing need is and and these policy loans are they're non qualifying there's no application you don't have to show any of your income you know you know you don't have to jump through any of the hoops that the banks are going to want 
And it's a non-recourse loan. The only thing collateralizes the policy itself. So whatever equipment you buy isn't, isn't encumbered, which is important. And it's got this feature of, of the growing in the background while you're using the money at, at extremely competitive rates, anywhere from two mm -hmm. to 5%, which particularly today is very attractive. So there's just a lot of advantages to be able to meet that cash access need in the short term without giving up that long-term you know, retirement planning goal. Mm -hmm. But someone might be thinking, like, I am a little confused. Like, I hear what you're saying, like, okay, you have this policy, but I can take money out and use it, but yet I still have the value. And then the taxes are different. Like, how does this really work for them if they're saying, okay, I need to buy a piece of equipment. I do want to pull money out. How does that affect my taxes? And how does that affect the value? How can it stay the same if I'm you know, still using the money, right? So I think there's a lot of those questions that are probably swirling in people's heads right now. For sure. And, and a lot of it too, a lot of the information online and a lot of the marketing leads people kind of down the wrong road as if you're borrowing from yourself and, and this whole concept. It's not really how it works. So as mm -hmm. I mentioned, life insurance companies are highly regulated. They can't go out and buy Bitcoin. Right. They, the regulators would have a fit. So they have to invest in things like highly rated corporate bonds and mortgages and so forth. Well, one of the investments that a life insurance company can make that the regulators like is they can make loans to their own policy owners. So really what's happening is the life insurance company is saying, OK, John, you own a policy. It has this much cash value in it and it has a death benefit associated with that. The limit of what we'll loan you is that cash value that you have in your policy. And we're going to use the death benefit as collateral. Mm. So we're borrowing from the insurance company, not from our own policy or, you know, we're not physically pulling money out of the cash value on the policy. We're borrowing from the insurance company up to the amount of cash value we have in the policy. That's the limit of what the loan is. Mm -hmm. And then the death benefit is the collateral. That's why it's a no qualifying, no recourse. We have complete control over the repayment terms. We can pay it back when, however we want to over any amount of time because the insurance company is collateralized by the death benefit. If you die mm -hmm. and you don't pay the loan back, they're gonna offset the, the, the principal and interest from the, the death benefit before the remainder of the proceeds goes to your beneficiaries. So because of that scenario, it creates a, a unique environment. We do pay a little bit of interest, like I said, two to 5%, depending on, on how you set up the repayment structure, goes to the insurance company as part of their investment portfolio. And one of the aspects of this I've always thought was, was kind of neat is that I own a policy, I can borrow money from the insurance company at very low interest rates, use it for whatever I want to use it for, repay myself under any terms that I want to repay. I pay a little bit of interest to the insurance company for doing that because it's an investment for them. And then if they perform better than expected at the end of the year, they pay me a dividend. Mm -hmm. So it's sort of this interesting loop with, with their own policy owners. I'm actually helping the company perform better than expected, right? And, mm. and then they pay me the dividend. So that's the way I like to look at it. And I don't know if that helps clear it up. Sometimes that explanation does help clear it up. It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's nothing magical. The values continue to grow in the background. And not all companies do that, by the way. It's called non-direct recognition. And every company doesn't have that. But essentially what it's saying is you've borrowed money from us, the insurance company, not from your policy. So those values are still there. And we're crediting mm -hmm. the dividend and the interest as we normally would on the full value of your policy, uh, not, not recognizing non-direct recognition that this loan exists. Mm -hmm. So they're kind of two separate things. So since this is associated also with like a life insurance policy too, is there like a limit as to like when you can actually pull something out just to make sure you have time to pay it back or just like, well, you take it out today and something happens. It's no problem. Even if you're 80 years old, you know, I don't know how that would work. Uh, there really is no, no limit. And other than the, the amount of cash value in the policy limits, how much you mm -hmm. can borrow. That's really the only limit that's there. Um, an example I use quite often, I have a, a business owner client, he owns franchise restaurants, fast food restaurants, and he wanted to open a new location. And he was trying to get money from the bank and got very frustrated with, with that situation to, to finance this new opening. Um, and that's when I met him. And so we, we built a plan, worked very closely. I always stress this. We worked very closely with his CPA, with his accountant mm -hmm. to do this in the right way. But he liquidated a retirement plan. He used that money to fund a cash value life insurance policy. 
Um, there is a bit of an underwriting process, so it took maybe a month to get the underwriting completed and the policy issued. But literally within one week of the policy being issued, he then borrowed the amount he needed from that policy and opened that new location. His businesses collectively, all the stores, paid him back for that. His CPA said he could charge X amount of interest, which was mm-hmm. far more than the interest rate he was paying on the loan. And so not only did that cash flow management work very well for him, he didn't, it was very easy to get the money once the policy was issued, but he also created a whole series of tax advantages. There mm-hmm. was an investment expense he could write off on the policy loan side. There was the the loan payments coming back to him from his company aren't subject to self-employment tax because they're loan payments. So it was a, an opportunity to extract some income from the business with, and avoid self-employment tax. You know, the, the, it reduced the business tax side of things because those loan payments are now offset against business income. So there was a whole series of tax advantages that were built into that scenario by using the policy. So so that was a perfect example. He was able to, to access the money virtually immediately after the policy was issued to do what he needed to do. And this was quite a few years ago. It's He's paid that loan back now. He's actually got two more policies and now he's kind of building a retirement plan with this policy. So it, is these things also are the whole life, right? It's your entire life mm-hmm. that they cover you. So they kind of leapfrog through your life and the different, different events that you have. Nice. And it was nice to hear too, there's not really a waiting period then like some things you would think like oh i have to invest for a period of time before i can take something out but you were saying almost immediately he was able to get that out so that's interesting as well yes and that's because he was able to to, you know the the real trick i think for most people is how do you get the money in the policy and Mm -hmm. for for some people that's a a, over time right they they put it in every month over time but it is it is possible to get a lump sum on the front end into the policy which is what this gentleman did by liquidating that retirement account, he was able to drop a, a fairly large lump sum into the policy, which then gave him virtual instant access to that money. Nice. And I know when we have like normal quote unquote retirement plans, as I'm thinking of them, there's all these like managed mm-hmm. fees like that you pay every mm-hmm. month. Like what are the fees that you would have associated with investing this way instead of through what we consider like a traditional method? That's a great question, Candy. And another area that I think a lot of folks out there just don't understand the impact of fees. Mm-hmm. The Department of Labor did a study that basically said a difference in 1% of fees could make a 28% difference in your balance over, oh, wow. over 30 years, right? Yeah. It's a big difference. Mm-hmm. I have a little calculator that I put together that I use with clients to kind of explain this. And if, if I put $500,000 in an account and I pay a 1% fee over 25 years, those fees will add up to just over a third of the account value if that account grows at 3% every year, which it won't, but but that's the assumption that we'll use. So what's important to understand about fees is they, they, they accumulate. If you pay an asset under management fee, 1% or 2% or 3%, you don't see that too much nowadays, but they are still out there. They accumulate over time so that in the first year, it doesn't look bad, 1%. This is a, seems like a reasonable figure, but then the next year it's 1% again, and the next year it's 1% again, and the next year it's 1% again. And so it builds up on itself. With insurance products, it doesn't work that way. Most insurance products, whether it's a, a life insurance or an annuity product, the costs are built into the product. And so if you compare it side by side, so for instance, the comparison that I do all the time with that scenario I just mentioned is worth worth 35% of the account value and fees. If we take the same 25 year period in a cash value life insurance policy based on the cash value growth, the total cost or the total fees involved in that that are, that are going to the agent basically are around maybe three to 4% over that same 25 years. So it's a significant mm-hmm. difference in the in the cost of these products. And unfortunately, it, with the way it gets spun is they're comparing 1% t- to the total cost on the other side, right? And they're not talking about the cumulative value over, over time. And that's really mm-hmm. where we have to look at it. What's the volume of fees compared to the volume of fees, not the percentage? Right. 
Well, I know we're running short on time. This has been a fabulous discussion, very informative too, but is there like anything else you would like to share that I didn't think to ask before we get to the end? Just one thing I can think of, and that is, um, I sort of alluded to it early on that I think what, what gets missed with modern financial planning is that it's all about income, right? It used to be that people worked for a company, they had a pension and that pension would pay them for the rest of their lives. And when the ERISA Act was passed in the 70s and the 401k became a thing, and now it's virtually the only retirement plan that a lot of people have, there's all the focus by the, by the conventional apparatus is on accumulation. How, what's mm -hmm. your number, right? How big a number do you need? When in reality, what that's supposed to do is provide that pension that people used to get. What's a pension? Mm -hmm. A pension is a recurring monthly income for life. And so that should be the focus when we're planning for retirement is how do we how do we create that stream of passive income down the road? How are we going to convert these retirement plans into income? And most mm -hmm. people have don't think about that and it's not really talked about. So that would be my thing. Focus on the income creation when you're planning. Perfect. Well, I would like to ask if you have any offer that you would like to extend to our listeners and how can they connect with you if they want more information? Absolutely. I have a, a landing page set up at jump on with John, J O H N John.com. And that will give you access to my calendar and you can schedule a free 30 minute a strategy session because uh, what I do may, may be a fit for some and not for others. And the best thing to do is have a casual conversation and find out. Again, as I alluded to earlier, my promise is I don't do pressure. So uh, mm -hmm. I just want to talk to people, educate them. And if it's a right fit, we'll both know it pretty quick. So it's jumponwithjohn.com. You can grab free 30 minutes in my calendar and, and we can chat. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for being a guest on my show and talking about this. I know like a lot of people probably never even heard of this before, the concept that you could have a life insurance policy with cash value and borrow against it. So thank you so much for discussing that with me today. My pleasure, Candy. It's been a lot of fun. Thank you, listeners, for tuning in today. I hope you found this topic interesting and enjoyed the informative discussion. Would you please share my show with those you know and leave a review on your favorite podcast platform? I'd really appreciate your support. If you have any additional questions or comments, be sure to reach out to my guest at any of the links that they shared, or you could send me a message at media at abandp.com. I hope you can join me for my next interview. And remember, you can connect with me on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. And my website is abandp.com. This episode is sponsored by Affordable Bookkeeping and Payroll Services. If you are overwhelmed trying to handle the financial aspects of your business, ABMP is here to help. Contact us today to discuss your needs at 310-534-5577 or contact at abandp.com. My team and I are eager to assist you. Until next time, have a great day. Thank you for listening to Biz Help For You. Please join your host, Candy Messer, again next time. Have a terrific day.